Hello, everyone, and welcome to our event today about designing pharmacies towards an accessible, patient-centered, and service-oriented model of practice. Uh, good morning, or good evening, or good afternoon. We've seen colleagues joining from literally all around the world. And um, so welcome all to this uh, event today. If we can have the next slide, please. Thank you. Just, just to start with a few announcements and practicalities. So you know this webinar is being recorded and it's also being live streamed via YouTube. So you can always go back and watch it again or share it with your friends and colleagues if they want to uh, watch it later on. Um, you will find the recording at our events website, so www.events.fip.org. Um, and you will see that you have we have a Q&A box uh, um, and we have the chat function. So for questions to our panelists, please use the Q&A box so that they receive the questions. Uh, and also for comments and for greetings, you may use the chat box. Uh, we also welcome you to send any comments you may have or any feedback or suggestions to webinars at FIP.org. And we encourage you, if you're not already an individual member of FIP, uh, we encourage you to consider becoming a member. You can see the, the address there, the URL, where you can register as an individual member of uh, FIP. Thank you. My name is Gonzalo Sosa Pinto. I'm the FIP lead for practice development and transformation, and I'm happy to be the moderator of today's webinar. And just a few reflections before I introduce our speakers today and, and our program. And um, this is the first time actually that FIP organizes an event about architecture and design of pharmacies. And rather than being simply a discussion about aesthetics or architecture or design, uh, it really is about uh, a discussion about how the, the aesthetics are, how the design of spaces and the, and, and the architecture of spaces is overtly linked to the portfolio that I have the, the pleasure of leading at NFIP, meaning how it helps us to develop and to transform the way we practice pharmacy. The physical spaces where we practice and where we serve our patients and our communities are an integral part of how we practice and the services that we offer and the way that our patients and our communities perceive our role, perceive our pharmacies, perceive our profession, and the way that our teams, uh, whether it's pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, the, our entire teams, as well as patients themselves feel when they are at the pharmacy. It is important that our colleagues feel that the pharmacy itself is a welcoming and uh, an enabling environment to work at, but also that patients and our communities feel that it's a space where they can feel well, that they have the adequacy, the clinical adequacy and the privacy they have for receiving the care that they need. And also uh, the way that our spaces, our pharmacy spaces are designed and the architecture of our pharmacies is clearly, it can function either as a facilitator or a barrier for uh, the provision of a number of services. And I'm sure that you understand clearly what I'm talking about, that some of the new services that pharmacies are providing around the world clearly requires specific spaces within our pharmacies. And we need to develop uh, the projects for these spaces to, in alignment with those innovations in pharmacy practice as well. But in addition to the provision of services, our spaces also need to consider the, the different and specific needs of our patients and our communities and ensure that we leave no one behind. And our program today will also address that, how the space addresses mobility, specific mobility needs or vision or hearing needs, uh, and the way that the space is welcoming to those uh, patients and members of our community that may have specific needs as well. And also, so having the appropriate spaces, the appropriate furniture, the appropriate equipment will enable us to provide those new services with the functionality that we need but also uh, ensure that services like vaccination or medicines use reviews 
or provision of point of care testing, for example, or the management of chronic non-communicable diseases on a one-to-one -one interactions with patients, need, those services need to take place in a space that is comfortable, that is clinical ad clinically adequate, that has the appropriate equipment to do so, but also that patients feel that they have the privacy to have a conversation with the pharmacist about their specific clinical situation. And finally, beauty or aesthetics. And cl clearly, beauty and aesthetics are not superfluous. And they are not dispensable. They are an essential component of the design of a pharmacy. And, and they are not superfluous because they everything communicates. And the way a, a space is designed and developed communicates how a profession is sees itself and how we welcome patients and the model of practice that we want to offer patients and we want them to perceive uh, that pharmacy is practiced there. Uh, and it's also about comfort and harmony and, and care. So uh, a well-designed space that is beautiful and comfortable is also communicating that it's a space where we will take good care of our patients and our communities. So really architecture and design touches upon all these different elements that you see on the screen here and that our various speakers today will be addressing in their presentations. And if I can have the next slide, please. Thank you. So for today's webinar, the, the learning objectives include uh, that we hope that you may learn about a patient-centric approach to the design of healthcare spaces including community pharmacies, but we will touch also upon the design of other types of healthcare facilities. Also about the development of design projects for community pharmacies that enable the provision of specific services by pharmacists. And also what are the implications of architectural aspects of community pharmacy in patient care and pharmacy practice. So for today's uh, webinar, the program uh, uh, will, will include a presentation by Raimond Pinto, an interior design uh, from Barcelona and also practicing in the United States, um, who, who will address the topic of considerations for the design of healthcare spaces. And Raimond has a great deal of expertise and experience in, develop, in designing uh, healthcare spaces of different types. That we will then have a presentation a joint that was jointly developed by uh, Ranjit Dital and, and also our colleague Joseph. Um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, we, we 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 missed including your name on on the on this slide, Joseph. Uh, but Joseph is here with us today, Joseph Cook, and developed this presentation together with Ranjita. And we will have a video presentation by Ranjita, and then Joseph will address any questions that you may have in relation to this presentation. And they have been doing a very interesting research uh, project uh, to review the effects of the physical and social aspects of community pharmacy environments on pharmacy patients and staff's engagement with pharmacy health services. And we will then have a presentation about co-designing pharmacies with patients and ensuring that accessibility for all is part of the design of pharmacies. And, and Laura Martin Gutierrez from Spain will be present, presenting the guidelines developed by the General Pharmaceutical Council of Spain. And then we will conclude with a presentation from Greece by Aliki Pelletidi, uh, which uh, called towards an ideal architectural model for the 2030 community pharmacy. Um, and Aliki will also include a, a presentation of the winning project of a competition for architecture students uh, for the design of a community pharmacy. We will then have some time for questions from the audience. So please do uh, type your questions on the Q&A box and we'll, that will bring us to the closure of today's event. So without further ado, we will, uh, hand, I will hand the floor, the floor to uh, Raimond Pinto, uh, an interior designer of healthcare facilities uh, from uh, Barcelona and New York. So Raimond uh, practices both in Barcelona and New York, which must be the longest commute uh, ever. Um, 
but uh, Raymond's studio has these two uh, headquarters, both in Barcelona and, and New York. And he specializes in transforming conceptual ideas into relatable spaces, developing a narrative and creating a custom visual language to fit each project's needs and context in order to craft a cohesive, aesthetic, humanizing experience. Uh, Ramon Studio uses a multidisciplinary design approach to solve the design needs of spaces, and the studio has used a holistic approach on numerous hospitals and institutional projects over the years, achieving expertise in delivering narratives for spaces and identity design solutions. Uh, Raymond Studio has received numerous awards for his various projects, including the Art, Art Directors Club from New York, the Interior Design Magazine from New York, the D and AD London, and ADG Laos, amongst other awards. So it is a pleasure for us to include um, Raymond's presentation in today's webinar. Uh, I must also share that uh, Raymond was a colleague of mine when I studied interior design as well. So I have a background both in pharmacy and interior design, and it's great to see all the projects that he has uh, developed in the meantime. Raymond, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Gonzalo, for the introduction. I'm going to show my presentation. Let me know if you you are you are seeing my presentation, right? Yes, Raymond. All okay. good. Hello, everyone, and and thank you uh, very much for the invitation. Um, as Gonzalo was saying, my 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 background is very different than 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 pharmacy. And it's basically design, as, as he was explaining. And uh, I haven't had the opportunity actually to design a pharmacy, but through my professional career, my studio and I um, have had the opportunity to design uh, so many type of uh, spaces for health, clinics, hospitals, mental health centers, and wellness spaces. Uh, my team is a group of interior designers and architects who usually team up with graphic designers or other professionals in the design industry to be able to respond to a broad assignments that require multidisciplinary teams. Uh, design for Health is a very uh, is a field of work uh, in the design industry where, where there is a lot to do uh, because design had a traditionally stronger presence in other sectors and there hasn't been much impact of the spaces for health. But for a few years has been a change in this trend. And today, many health centers, they, they have uh, departments um, that take care of this. Um, and also they hire uh, uh, independent professionals uh, for, for carrying uh, out these, uh, these uh, requirements. Um, uh, um, And the type of work that we do uh, is um, interior design mainly, but also uh, design also other types of um, works uh, or that they depend from this interior design, like furniture design, bespoke elements or bespoke parts of the space, uh, environmental graphics uh, or artworks. And, and we also cover even um, other uh, needs like signage. Uh, it's a sort of things that are happening and are, are happening in the in this type of buildings, and ultimately, is the management of everything that happens in the space that creates a specific atmosphere and affects the the user experience. The presentation is brief, and I just want to explain three points uh, that seem important to me when designing and on which my team and I base our uh, approach to work when facing uh, a new project. I decided to illustrate each, each uh, point of this with a project that we designed in the studio. And also, you will see 
that each uh, project uh, that I'm showing also accomplishes the, the, the three mentioned points. To explain this point, I will show parts of an oncology and hematology area of a hospital in a small inland city, not far from Barcelona. Uh, medical practice was traditionally almost the only aim of hospitals, basically diagnosis and treatment. And I bet we all agree today we should also pay attention to patients' well-being and experience in a more general sense. Uh, and that's precisely our goal by means of seeking a more human, when we, when we say that we are looking for a more humanized architecture. For us, it's important to separate the look and feel of today's hospitals from the negative stereotypes of traditional hospitals, uh, usually called distant, visually aseptic, and related in the collective imagination with pain, fear, discomfort, and so on. Instead, uh, we go for spaces that transmit values such as care, comfort, or even play. In other words, we go for a more human model of space for health. The approach we did in this project was to design these areas with materials and colors that are not usually used in these areas and some bespoke solutions with the aim of transforming the imaginary idea we have of a hospital space to space to, to an idea more about space related with health or, or wellness or, or well-being space. When we work with this type of projects, we always have the challenge of using materials that meet the specific hygienic and maintenance requirement. Despite these, we managed to create an atmosphere in these areas so the patients felt as comfortable as possible. In this case, we also add an extra layer in the project uh, that we call environmental design or some managers of the hospital they call humanization, which consists uh, of helping to create a certain atmosphere and creating bonds with the users. Uh, in this case, this hospital serves an inland region surrounded by mountains and rural areas. So we introduce visual poetry installations into the interiors referring to the nearest context of the hospital, rivers, mountains, villages, flora, fauna, uh, trying to establish connections with the population. And linking uh, to what I was explaining about trying to look for this connection with the, with the population. Uh, in this second point, um, I wanted to explain that we use this type of installations to create uh, atmospheres to connect with the users. Uh, the, case that, the, the case that I am explaining in this point is a project that we have been working since 2012, and we are still working reforming all the areas of the San Juan de Deu Barcelona Children's Hospital. This project is a really extensive uh, one, and I'm going to try to compress more than 10 years in, in, in few slides, uh, very brief. During these years, uh, we work on interior design, furniture design, uh, playgrounds, environmental graphics, interactive artwork, signage, so much. And to cover such a variety of needs, we work together with our own graphic design studio. And here what I'm showing, uh, this is the initial system uh, with which we define what uh, the visual language of this project would be. Uh, it works for us like a, like a cooking recipe uh, that we have to follow. Um, actually, in the third point of the presentation, I will explain the importance of this. Although seeing the photos of this project, you will see the visual cohesion that has given to this, to this institution over the years. For this um, hospital, uh, the visual language consists in a very specific distribution of the colors mainly, and because some colors and materials uh, for the interiors, for some of them are designated for the interior architecture and the opposite bright warm colors to design the animal installations. Also, we use the repetition of patterns to hide the animals and make them less recognizable, uh, less obvious. Uh, we also use a real scale animals in whole in the whole project, um, real scale animal silhouettes, and sometimes infographic um, strategies to explain curiosities such as how many birds clean the skin of an African elephant during one month, or how many acacia leaves a giraffe eats in one week. Um, 
um, what I want to emphasize in this point is the use of design to connect with the users. Uh, in this case, those uh, in the children's hospital. Uh, when connecting with users through design, it is essential to remember that all users are important and each one has a different sensibility. Uh, it's a common mistake uh, when designing a space for children to think that they are the only users. So children, but also parents, relatives and professionals. Uh, even within the age group of, the, of children, actually, in a hospital like this, uh, the range, uh, they range from babies to teenagers. And the sensitivities, the sensitivities are very uh, different depending on the age. Actually, sometimes are even opposite sen sensibilities. With this project, we try to do something for kids, uh, but not childish. Um, all the design strategies put into practice in this case have a clear objective. Uh, that is to reduce uh, the stress and fear when coming to a hospital and to create uh, a relaxing and comfortable uh, atmosphere, which we end up knowing by the professionals uh, working there that helps uh, sometimes during the medical practice. We usually do tailor-made concepts for each project or area. Uh, with tailor-made we mean uh, to design uh, to design thinking um, about how the space is going to be used and acknowledging thinking, acknowledging the patients, uh, how the patients are acknowledging how the patients are going to 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 use this space and what is going to be uh, their experience. Adapting the projects to a specific situation, thinking uh, in the experience of the patients, for example, how much time we spend in an ER box, um, how we can play when we have difficulties of mobility, uh, what we see when we are laying down in a bed, or what we see in the ceiling when we are moved by a stretcher. So we have to emphasize the, 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 the ceiling. Um, in this project, as you can see, we established a storyline along the institution uh, and the theme was called Animals Playing Hide and Seek and consists of hiding animals through the architecture. Uh, the project has uh, an additional content program that children can learn around the hospital areas uh, and, that, and, 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 and in this content explains curiosities about animals and nature. The entire project is a uh, custom design uh, with the specific solutions for each case uh, and area. And we, the, the, th the third point, uh, we actually, the, the, the project that we just saw, uh, it also explains this third point that is designing parts in order to design a whole system. So we use the strategy of creating storylines, narratives, or themes through the space. Um, as mentioned in the previous point, uh, the other very important point in the way we work is the definition of a visual language. Uh, we saw in the last project, and we can see it in this one, uh, it brings visual cohesion in the space and the branding and it also makes it recognizable and it helps to have unity when designing the different parts. Uh, in this case, I'm showing uh, you a dental clinic that we design in a city in the Basque Country, which is a good example of generating uh, an identity for the place from the logo to the stationery to the interior design or the facade of the clinic. Once again, we did tailor-made solutions and materials specially selected for this project. And it's important to understand these bits uh, as part of a whole system. And this means designing at first the guidelines that later we rule uh, all the parts. And that's basically designing an identity that uh, arranges the spaces and makes them recognizable according to specific values. And 
considering these three points that we are driven by, uh, in my studio and the work we, we try to do uh, every day, we try to deliver projects carefully designed for the persons who have the experience, the spaces, trying to be adaptable to the diversity of sensitivities and helping the institution to be unique and visually cohesive. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ramon. Excellent presentation and, and super interesting projects. And I think that even though these projects are not specifically of a community, there must be several of the principles that you have des described are clearly applicable to design of community pharmacies as well. So our our listeners uh, and the audience uh, attending can also uh, apply the same principles when thinking of uh, how to design pharmacy um, with a patient-centric uh, approach and thinking of the needs of both the, the, the services that are provided, but also the experience of the users of these places. So thank you very much. And if we can have the introductory slide for the next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, and our next speaker or speakers uh, are uh, Ms. Rajita Vital uh, from the Arts and Sciences Department of the University College in London, uh, who has developed this presentation together with Mr. Joseph Cook, a creative fellow also from the University College London uh, and an anthropologist. And I will introduce both, uh, and then we'll see that uh, we will have a video from Ranjita, who could not join us today live, uh, but currently agreed to uh, send a presentation, uh, a, vi a video recorded presentation. And then Joseph will be here for our discussion at the end. So Ranjita is a lecturer in interdisciplinary health studies at University College London, a registered pharmacist and a sculptor. He has practiced as an addiction specialist pharmacist, a community pharmacist, and worked in public health. Her public health research is informed by her clinical experience and creative participatory methodologies. Ranjita leads interdisciplinary arts-based research to understand how the physical and social spaces within community pharmacies are experienced by pharmacy patients and staff. This study examines how the architecture of pharmacies may affect engagement with current and future pharmacy health services to co-produce a community pharmacy design guide. So well, this is on the dot exactly the, on the subject of today's webinar. And Joseph, uh, an anthropologist and a creative fellow, fellow at UCL, uh, has a background in architecture with recent projects investigating healthcare access issues for London's both developed community and social prescribing and the arts in London's East End. Alongside working with Dr. Ranjita Bital on the Architecture of Pharmacies project, he also leads UCL's Citizen Science Academy. So uh, we will now uh, see and uh, watch the video presentation by uh, Ramjita Dita. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And my name is Ranjita. Thank you very much for inviting me to present to you about my research exploring how patients and staff experience the pharmacy, community pharmacy environment. And I'm really pleased to be here at this FIP digital event. And thank you, Goncalo and Rubin, for inviting me. So I'm going to share my screen with you, my slides. Hopefully that's worked OK. So uh, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, my research and uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person but um, well I can't be with you live um, but uh, Joseph Cook my colleague who's also involved with me on this project will be there to answer any questions and take part in the panel discussion so I'm a, a lecturer in interdisciplinary health studies in the art and sciences department at UCL and I'm also a registered pharmacist and uh, I'm just going to here we go. Yeah, so for my talk, I'm going to really put a case why I think interdisciplinarity 
is needed for pharmacy practice and research and uh, what are the potentials of doing this. And I, I really don't think we've engaged with this enough. And uh, I also present to you an overview of a systematic review that was conducted a couple of years ago uh, by, my, by myself and the research team, the findings from that, and then looking at the future, looking at possibly a transdisciplinary um, pharmacy practice and research and what that could hold for us. So thank you. So a little bit about me. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a pharmacist. I used to practice as an addiction specialist pharmacist and in public health. And then now I'm full time in, um, in, in academia. And, um, and my research is really exploring um, community pharmacy services and particularly public health alcohol problems. And my area is also now expanded to global health and um, looking at creative approaches to conducting research and I apply this in my research and my teaching and I'm also a sculptor I sculpt and paint so therefore my interests and backgrounds have really shaped and formed the way way I do my research and and my teaching so thank you um, so community pharmacies um, so vital and so important as as we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic all around the world and how these spaces are essential for us and pharmacies are the most accessed health space we have whoops, in, in the world. And uh, in the UK, there's about 14,000 pharmacies. And uh, there's the most kind of numerous health space we have. And the pharmacy staff are the large, third largest healthcare professional group worldwide. So really, you know, really significant um, potential for public health. And uh, in the UK anyway, um, there's been a really huge uh, change in the pharmacy practice. A lot of pharmacists are now involved in public health services, which are funded and supported by, by the National Health Service, by the government. And in the UK, the curricula is also changing. And soon in a few years, our pharmacy graduates will graduate as independent prescribers. So a huge change. So while all of this is going on, it's been really surprising how there's been very little exploration about the effects of the physical and social aspects of the pharmacy environment, where all these change, where all these activities are taking place, really hasn't been explored. And uh, here's an image of a pharmacy consultation room where some of these services I mentioned take place. And this is a an, an image from from a publication. And uh, you can see here this space really has a, you know, doesn't look great. It's just very cluttered. There's things underneath the table. There's you know, items that are not health related. What sort of image does this does this uh, you know send to both the pharmacist and the patient? Can you imagine being a patient sitting there talking to the pharmacist? Uh, would you feel that your health and concerns were really being understood, or you felt comfortable to even express them? And as a pharmacist, what you know, what must they be feeling? Are they able to adequately really communicate their expertise and skills? Um, to, to focus on the patient here, uh, pr very, probably unlikely. So these are the areas that I'm really surprised at that we haven't explored. And uh, I kind of came across these this thinking when I was doing my own research in pharmacy practice, and it, that involved uh, a new service for pharmacists to talk to the public about their drinking as part of a, developing this brief intervention. And uh, though the, the pharmacists were kind of really found um, developing their communication skills, really interesting and enjoyable. There's a space that really had to be considered. And even my project team, who I worked with, were very biomedical. They all tended to be from a, a similar sort of shared discipline, not very diverse. So therefore, that thinking wasn't diverse in order to ex explore that, the, the effects of, the, of space and the sensory experience. So uh, more images of, of pharmacies, dispensing spaces, and it and haven't hasn't really been thought about very well or carefully and even the pharmacy the shop floor um, is it a shop floor or is it a pharmacy or is it both or how can it be both and, and these kind of discussions haven't been really explored i mean having um, a retail space is very convenient for the public but how could this be optimized you know what do we really know about having these sort of duality, these two spaces coexisting. So these are really kind of interesting areas to, to explore. So a systematic review um, was uh, conducted a couple of years ago and 
there's the publication for this is available open access so from that link you can you can read the full paper and I was really pleased that this is a, a project from one of my master's students uh, Shubhafich Shaluwak and um, and others who are involved in, in this um, review so this is a really comprehensive and very detailed review and um, we searched 10 databases um, but in the English language um, and uh, we had no kind of like the, the beginning time for this so we, we were open to look at any any sort of published um, resource um, that that was available up to March 2020 and uh, we were also very keen not just to look at pharmacy patients experience but also their staff we thought it was important they really we needed to understand the experiences from 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 the from the pharmacy team as well, and we were looking at studies that that looked at the pharmacy environment, and explored the environment, and uh, and also those that kind of highlighted some sort of health or social out care outcome in in the findings. So when we were screening and and identifying papers, we were looking for empirical studies. So this means there were data driven studies uh, that had, had kind of a, like a methodological design that created some output at the end, uh, but not. And also we looked at any any sort of research design. It wasn't just quantitative. It could be it could be any design. So therefore, we weren't looking at reviews or opinion pieces, but data driven studies. And uh, so we screened all the titles and abstracts from the databases we identified. And we were really kind of careful, you know, we ensured that not to miss any important papers. So we did some random sort of sampling, um, like second or double checking of the papers that were in included, as well as those that were excluded, just to make sure we hadn't, we didn't miss anything. So this is the Prisma flow diagram. We identified 4,517 studies. Um, after removing the duplicates, uh, we were left with 3,605 from uh, title and abstract screening. Uh, we were left with 159. And uh, you know, from the 159, uh, we excluded um, articles and uh, from that, uh, where there was no, even though the pharmacy space was reported, if where studies that didn't report the participants' experience and that wasn't explored, then we excluded it. So therefore, we were left with these 80 articles that met our inclusion criteria. And data extraction, um, we looked at all the, the final studies. We created this Excel document to extract the data so we could look at the data horizontally and vertically to see the patterns and commonalities between the studies and what it was really telling us in terms of the design and the outcomes and implications. And um, we also wanted to look at the quality of these final studies. So we assessed its quality using this quality criteria called the integrated quality criteria for the review of multiple study designs. And uh, Throughout this process, we had, we had lots of discussions with, with, the, with the project team, with my students, Superfit and others, to just review the process. And because we included any study design, both quantitative and other designs, we used quantitative and a narrative synthesis approach uh, to identify themes from the review. So here are the findings. So of the 80 published studies, um, which were published between 94 to 2020, 60 were published between 2010 to 2020, which shows that this is when pharmacy practice research was most sort of um, active and uh, very little before then. And 29 countries were represented in the review, most from Europe and uh, North America and Australasia. Um, because our inclusion criteria was it had to be written in the English language. So that was a limitation of this review and it all kind of allowed only certain types of um, English publication written in English to be included. And you can see in the study designs, most were surveys, um, qualitative interviews and focus groups. There were no randomized controlled trials. And um, because our inclusion criteria wanted to explore experience, um, and uh, that's probably why um, the studies that we did find were more kind of qualitative in design. And, and this uh, sort of the last part of the slide, um, really interesting here, the kind of range of health conditions that were presented 
in the papers. You can see mental health really came up quite often. Eight, eight studies reported that, as well as drug and alcohol problems, sexual health, heart disease. And um, if you go down at the bottom of the list, you know, there was even a study that that explored about the effect of the pharmacy environment on intimate intimate partner violence. So our patients, pharmacy patients in, in these different countries were talking about all these different health and social conditions and, and, and personal situations um, where the environment um, uh, was explored and it showed how you know important that that is. And um, this is something we need kind of to build on and and see you know what could make a space optimal. And um, you know why is it a space not uh, not good and doesn't allow the patient to really engage in their health? So these were the findings for that. And um, so when we assess the quality of these studies, most met the cr minimum score criteria for the quality assessment, but half the studies did not meet the uh, like the quality criteria for uh, like so sort of generally the general quality criteria not and. Uh, a lot of the studies they lacked like a clear aim and a justification for methods and there was some sampling bias but you know we, we used we included studies that were mixed methods and uh, i think possibly the icroms tool may not have been uh, appropriate for that because the icroms tended to be more biased toward itself and more biased towards uh, quantitative research methods so it scored the qualitative studies probably less favorably so that's something to consider and we would have probably used kind of several tools rather than one sort of universal one. So the four themes that were generated from the analysis, privacy was really kind of a major theme. Our patients and staff and other visitors really kind of thought this was important to allow a meaningful engagement, a discussion about that one's health with the pharmacist and the pharmacy team. The experience of the physical environment was reported quite frequently, particularly to do with comfort, emotional, and the physical experience of the space. Professional image was sort of mentioned sort of um, briefly, not, not in many papers, four reported this, about you know, how the pharmacist was perceived, their perception uh, um, by others, and, uh, and also how they felt, like how uh, the image was considered negative because how the space didn't really bring out the best professional image for them. And interestingly, only kind of three papers um, discussed about the risk of errors and, uh, through uh, having inadequate pharmacy space and environment. And um, surprising because it, pharmacy, a lot of the practice it revolves around reducing risk, preventing risk and errors and so on. But when we were exploring environment and space, um, this didn't this didn't come up as much as privacy and the experience of the space. So uh, future recommendation, we know this was the first review, the systematic review to examine pharmacies in this way, and it really highlighted the need to have more engaging spaces for both patients and staff. <coughs> and um, a lot of the studies, <coughs> excuse me, that we saw. Um, you know, a lot of it, you know, they talked about the pharmacy environment. So incidentally, it wasn't its primary aim. Uh, yes, a lot of the studies were reviewing other types of pharmacy health services and, and space was mentioned as, as as something sort of as a side sort of topic. So really future research should really have the pharmacy environment as its primary aim and objective in its design and, uh, and explore some of the uh, the, the, the themes that were identified from this systematic review. So those are the recommendations for the future. Uh, so finally, like going towards a transdisciplinary future for pharmacy practice, so I'll explain what I mean by this. Um, currently, um, I'm in involved, uh, I'm leading this, this work, the architecture of pharmacy, and this is ongoing uh, with my colleague here, Joseph Cook, who's, who's with you. and. Uh, and uh, the the values and and the the ideas around this is is exploring um, like experience, and we're using a method called experience based co design to understand how patients, staff, or visitors experience the space, and that requires different types of methodology, particularly like participatory and creative methodologies, and particularly because. We want to look at, you know, that the experience is considered unique and precious. So we really need to be quite meaningful in how we capture this. So this is what the work that I'm doing. And 
and it, this is our project team, a very interdisciplinary um, team, very diverse. Um, we have Joseph, who is an uh, uh, anthropologist and also has an architectural background. We have a mental health professor, Glenn Robert, who was the co-founder of that experience-based co-design, art academic, architect, um, pharmacists, and we even have a, have a like a cultural historian, um, Barbara Caddock. So really important. And, you know, this has been really, I really enjoy the meetings that we have for this, for this uh, project, for this study. And it's been really enlightening to, to learn and find out so much about the different types of experiences of the pharmacy. And this is as an overview of, of what that project entails. So we're currently co-creating an evidence report. So I showed you here the systematic review and uh, but this is really kind of looking at other types of evidence so not just published research but in in other in other disciplines what's happening in architecture in health architecture what's happening in other kind of fields like other health fields like uh, medicine nursing and so on how are they engaging with health architecture so this will be really um, as an interesting report and it's the purpose is really to inform policy practice and research and um, engagement activities um, as part of this project will be um, going to and visiting pharmacies we'll be holding co-design workshops and art installations inside pharmacies to really kind of get sort of like the look and feel of the spaces the, the actual you know the sensory space and, and and this type these type of activities will create debate and discussions about the pharmacy space so and uh, we, we're going to disseminate this um, in, in a creative way, possibly an exhibition and other activities to really make visible and physical the recommendations from this project. And here um, we have an image of a video um, of Samantha um, uh, Walker, our collaborator for this study, and she's created this really lovely video about her experience with the pharmacy and what things are important for her and how things could be improved. And Joseph Cook here has, uh, we're developing a website, um, the, it's called the Architecture of Pharmacy, and uh, this video will be on, on, on the website. So we're really kind of like trying to, to share the different perspectives and experiences of the pharmacy space. And uh, yeah, so when I say, you know, transdisciplinary, a new paradigm for pharmacy practice and research, we really need to kind of broaden and go outside our kind of, sort of world of, of pharmacy uh, and make it and, and be kind of bold to look at other disciplines, what they use, other ways of knowing the way, uh, the traditional way of, of like knowledge creation. And we, we talk about research methods as qualitative, quantitative and mixed methods, but really a multimodal approach would be really exciting because, you know, this, this lovely painting here by Ed Gray, um, it shows our community and society are, are very diverse in different parts of the world. And the traditional way that we've been doing research and practice tends to favor certain types of groups and, and isn't even aware how um, this knowledge creation is undermining and, and not supporting and not understanding other types of experiences. So, and that's why I think we've got to the stage where the, the, the most obvious thing about the community pharmacy space really hasn't been considered. It's been a neglected topic. So, um, and the reason that I'm not with you live now is because I'm at this conference, the International Creative Research Methods Conference. So when I promote and, and the, the use of creative research methods is it's actually something that's already happening in other disciplines and we could really benefit from exploring this for pharmacy practice research and um, and in, in doing so uh, the National Centre for Creative Health uh, I'm uh, linked with them I've created uh, with them an in, a special interest group called the International Arts and Pharmacy Special Interest Group and uh, you're very welcome to join we do online events discuss a range of topics where we can bring arts into pharmacy practice research and education so and um, that's been a very exciting group and the link for it is, is there as well so uh, thank you very much and I'm, I'm really pleased um, that you're you're doing this and I'm sorry that I can't be with you but here's my contact details if you have any questions and also have the contact details of Joseph Cook who will answer questions that you may have and participate in the panel discussion so I'm going to stop sharing and uh, th 
and stop recording. So thank you very much. Goodbye. Um, hello again, and thank you very much, Ranjita, for this presentation. Although you're not here with us in, in presence, uh, I'm sure that uh, Joseph will uh, convey our gratitude and greetings to Ranjita for this excellent presentation. Uh, and Joseph will uh, join you for the Q&A and the discussion at the end of the line. So if I have the next, next slide, please. Exactly. Thank you very much. And it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, a dear colleague and friend, Laura Martín Gutiérrez, uh, from the General Pharmaceutical Council of Spain. Laura has collaborated uh, with uh, the, the Spanish organization, the Council, but also in multiple FIP events and publications over the years. And uh, she holds a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy and a Master of Science in Clinical Research and has worked as a community pharmacist and clinical research associate. Since 2008, Laura has been working for the development of professional pharmaceutical services, both at the national and international level. And since 2022, he's responsible for the coordination of the activities carried out by the professional sections of the General Pharmaceutical Council of Spain. And Laura will be addressing the topic of how to co-design pharmacies with patients or in, including the patient's perspectives and needs into the design of our pharmacy spaces and ensuring accessibility for all. She will be presenting the guidelines developed by the General Pharmaceutical Council of Spain uh, to support the adaptation of pharmacy spaces across the country to meet the needs of our communities and patients. Laura, thank you so much. And uh, very, very welcome to the webinar. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo. And um, I would like to thank the FIP for, for this invitation uh, to this webinar. And during my presentation uh, today, I think you can see the screen now, full screen. Yeah. During my, my presentation this afternoon, I will uh, give you a brief introduction just uh, to contextualize the situation in, in Spain, in our country, and then I will uh, guide you through the, the work that we have uh, developed from the General Pharmaceutical Council of Spain in the last few years, including that guide that Gonzalo mentioned, so Accessible Pharmacies for All, and I will show you as well a seminar we, we held on accessibility, and just to conclude, I will give you a a key messages uh, just to, to emphasize. Uh, well, uh, the introduction is just to, to let you know the, the scenario in Spain. There are uh, 22,220 uh, community pharmacy in, in our country, and there is a ratio of 4.7 pharmacies uh, per 10,000 inhabitants. So uh, as you can imagine with these uh, figures, uh, community pharmacies are one of the, the closest and, and most accessible uh, healthcare professionals to the, to the public. And, and we mean accessible both at geographically uh, level because we have a 99% of coverage of the national territory, but as well uh, in terms of uh, extended uh, business hours. Uh, most of the community pharmacies in Spain uh, are open for 12 hours. Uh, there are many with uh, offering 24 hour services as well. And in places where there are no these uh, 24 hour services pharmacies, we have on call rotation. So we can guarantee the access to medicines and to, to professional pharmaceutical services at any time. However, um, we uh, there is still a need to improve accessibility to goods and, and services. Uh, bearing in mind that you know we have people with different functional capabilities, and in the case of pharmacy users, we have more than one third of uh, people that come to to a community pharmacy that experience any any uh, some form of access in 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 access limitation okay so um with this introduction i just wanted to 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 show you that a uh, our legislation includes the definition of a uh, universal accessibility and a uh, universal design okay so uh, you have to uh, bear in mind that in spain there is a legal obligation there is a requirement to have a 
our pharmacies uh, as an, a, an adapted space, especially, you know, the, the pharmacies that are open uh, more recently, you know, the old uh, traditional uh, settings, but uh, you have to, to, to take care of all these, uh, these uh, legislation and all these regulations in order to open, uh, to open your a community pharmacy, okay? From the definition of universal accessibility, I just want you to highlight that cognitive accessibility is included and this means that a uh, easy to read alternative and augmentative communication system or the use of pictograms are included in in our legislation okay and um, for the universal design i just want to highlight that uh, it is important that it has to be conceived from the outset okay from the from the beginning it doesn't mean that you have to adapt the the place uh, when you, we talk about universal design okay i'm not talking about when you need to make any adaptation of, of the space because you need to create a, a more accessible space in your in your pharmacy but by the definition universal design or design for all includes this uh, this concept of to be conceived from the from the outset well, this is uh, was just the introduction, and now I will show you uh, this guide that we launched back in 2013. Okay, this uh, guide is just a compilation of recommendations. Okay, uh, for community pharmacies in order to make them more accessible. Okay, for for people with disabilities. We uh, work uh, this guide uh, in collaboration with Sanofi that I am sure you all uh, know who Sanofi is, but uh, you may not know uh, Fundación Once. And Fundación Once is a, a non-profit organization uh, that is specialized in the, in the in the implementation of uh, programs for uh, the integration of uh, people with disabilities. They make uh, employment programs, training programs. Uh, they offer uh, employment opportunities for these, uh, these, uh, these uh, p uh, persons with, with disabilities. And uh, it also promotes the, the global accessibility by fostering uh, services, environments, uh, products, and uh, uh, including everything in the design of what they, they do. So uh, with these two collaborators, we we create this guide uh, with two main objectives that you can see in the slide. The first one was to delve into the concept of accessibility at community pharmacy level. And as well, the, the second objective was to provide recommendations to, to improve the, the accessibility. Uh, this is the table of contents of this, uh, of this guide. Uh, Unfortunately, I haven't got enough time to, to go through all the, the guides, so I will focus on the second one, on the required elements to improve accessibility in community pharmacies. But as you can see on the slide, uh, there is an explanation of what is universal accessibility in this guide, as well as ergonomics for community pharmacy, the workforce, the, the, the persons, the people working on, on the community pharmacy. Uh, there is a compilation of all the national and regional legislation that is applicable to, to the design of the, of the community pharmacy. Pharmacy. There is a glossary of terms as well in the in the guide, and then there is a tool at the end of the of the guide for you to uh, make a self assessment and to see how your your pharmacy, how accessible your your pharmacy is. Uh, as I said, we only go through the, the elements for, for improving accessibility, and this section of, of the guide divides in, in five different, different points. Uh, the first one is about access to the pharmacy premises. The second one is about the, the design of the interiors of the, of the pharmacy. The third one uh, covers all the things about the information and communication, how you uh, inform uh, all your clients or your patients about the products and the services that, that you're offering in your community pharmacy. The fourth uh, point is about how to proceed in an emergency situation, how to uh, guide people through uh, the pharmacy to the exit, etc. when you have an emergency situation. And the fifth point is about uh, how you can adapt your practice your language uh, to um, make your practice uh, more uh, accessible for people with uh, disabilities. There are recommendations on how to deal with uh, people with, with any uh, disability. 
So uh, for the access to the pharmacy premises, this section covers, as you can see is the, in the slide, uh, from the location and identification of the community pharmacy, including uh, the cross location, how the cross should be, the design of the cross, the materials that you uh, can use, the lining, etc., as well as how uh, display windows should be as well, and the entrance, if there is a, a street level entrance, uh, if there is not, if, uh, if you need to, to use a ramp and non sleep a ramp, if there are the stairs, if, uh, the, if there is a need to, to install banisters or handrails, etc., as well as the dimensions of, of the door, for example, if they have, uh, they, they have to be automated doors, uh, and so on. The second part of this section in, in the guide is about the, the design, the interior design of, of the pharmacy. And this is covering how the flooring should be, how the connection areas as well should be, just to create you know, the flow of, the, of all the, the patients in the, in the pharmacy. The furniture that is uh, important, uh, the type of furniture that you should uh, have on your community pharmacy, if it has to be anchored to the floor, uh, if a uh, Try to avoid, for example, uh, glass walls. Uh, though during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this is this is a uh, quite a. Uh, useful and, and we have all of us in our community pharmacies these uh, glass walls this is a, a barrier to communication so there is not a is not recommended anymore uh, so uh, this uh, kind of information is included in in this part uh, of the guide and then as well there is a a, um, a mention of how the design of the restroom should, should be in order to 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 uh, foster the, the use of uh, this restroom from, from people with, with disability, with mobility problems. Uh, the third part of the of the of this section in the guide is about the signage, about how you can provide the information about the the the, the services that you are providing or the medicines that you are offering from the community pharmacy. And here you can uh, find recommendation on how the height of the banner should be, uh, the size of the of the of the letters uh, you are using, uh, the type of uh, of the font that you are using to be more legible, etc., uh, or the use of pictograms as well. And uh, this part also, also includes the, the, the need to use or the recommendation to use communication aids, such as induction loops or the use of braille labeling. And you can see there is underlined that part of accessible uh, documents and, and, and information. And this is because I um, I want to show you something uh, later on, okay? Because uh, you have to to make uh, information available for for everyone, and and there is a recommendation to have uh, these accessible formats in your in your community pharmacy. As I mentioned, the fourth uh, point was about uh, how to proceed in in emergency situation, how correct signaling, and and how you have to have a visual on audible alarms uh, the uh, use of our extinguishers as well as accessible for everyone and the fifth part of this section of the guide for me is the the one that makes a difference okay because the 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 for the previous four one uh, was uh, the the sections that uh, compiles recommendations from, from our legislation, from regulations existing or for recommendations that are uh, available. But the, this fifth uh, point is interesting because in here you can find tips on how to deal with uh, people with disabilities. And uh, these tips are different if uh, you are dealing with a person with motor, visual, hearing uh, impairments, or if there is a person with a special communication needs uh, or if they have comprehension difficulties, behavioral disorders, or when you deal with a, a, an individual with a short stature. So these are a different, as I said, tips uh, on how to, to, to deal with a disabled person on your everyday in, in your community pharmacy. And I underline the uh, point of a having accessible documents and information for, for everyone. And I want to show you another 
a project that we uh, have uh, in the General Pharmaceutical Council of Spain, and that is a, an application, it's a free app called Medicament Accessible Plus. Uh, the first version of this app was uh, launched in, in 2014, so we have had uh, several updates. And uh, with this app, uh, um, you can have access to information about medicines uh, easy to read and it works uh, alongside with all the communication aids uh, and accessible uh, tools that you have on your on your mobile phone. You can find information of medicine by searching uh, the name of the medicine, the national code. You can have as well, uh, you can read with your camera, with the phone camera, the, the code of the medicine. And uh, you have access to uh, information uh, about the indication, the need of prescription for the medicine, instructions for use, if there are any uh, advice uh, for your pharmacies, uh, advice uh, any other uh, event, etc. As well, you can check your favorites in there so you can have quick access to, to that information. You can include the expiration date so you can have a notification in case of that medicine uh, reach the, the expiry date. And as well, you can uh, include information about personal uh, conditions such as if you have any allergy, intolerances, if if you're pregnant, if you're breastfeeding, if you're an athlete and you have to be uh, careful with uh, doping uh, substances. So you can have this information as well in the, in the app and you will, uh, you will have a, a prompt and alert as well on your, on your mobile when you have any match with the medicine that, that you are using. And as well, this application has a allocator of, of pharmacies. Um, as I mentioned, we, uh, we uh, issued this uh, app uh, back in 2014. It's available for iOS and, and for Android. And well, it's in Spanish, but you, know, you can have a, a reference in there if, if it's interesting for you. And just to conclude, with the guide, I just want to show you this uh, slide about uh, the tool that we included uh, to make a self-assessment. And this is particularly useful if you want to see how accessible is your pharmacy or if you have an accessible space uh, to see if there are any areas for, for improvement, okay? It's just uh, to check yes or no to different, uh, different uh, categories such as entrance, the pharmacy doors or the ramp, for example, uh, as you can see in this, in this slide. And just to uh, conclude with my presentation, just to, to to show you the latest initiative that we have uh, carried out from, from, from here, from the General Pharmaceutical Council. It was a seminar on accessibility. It was held on, on Madrid back uh, in the 9th of May this year. Okay, this uh, seminar was half a day seminar and, and there was a debate about how to uh, further improve accessibility and how to uh, eliminate barriers in, in community pharmacies and in, in, the, in the pharmacy profession in, in general. And uh, we also uh, showcase uh, examples of best practices in, in community pharmacies, including a uh, integration of people with disabilities as a community pharmacy workforce. We also uh, explain how to make uh, the pharmacy an adapted space for everyone. Uh, we uh, presented as well a, a campaign about how to uh, improve the access for information for people with autism. And uh, we presented as well Medicamento Accessible Plus uh, and the latest version of Medicamento Accessible Plus. This seminar is online, it's on the YouTube channel of the General Pharmaceutical Council that is called Pharmaceuticos. Um, I'm afraid it's in Spanish, but if you are interested, you can check the videos uh, there. And to conclude, I just want to, to give you a few key messages and that I think that are important is that when we talk uh, about accessibility, we mean quality of life for everyone and it's a added value. Uh, uh, we talk about freedom and autonomy. Uh, accessibility responds to the real needs uh, of users and it is a right and as I mentioned before it's a legal obligation sometimes and it 
does not have to be complex or have to be expensive. It has to be clever, okay? And it must uh, guarantee the safety and autonomy and dignity of, of users. And from the professional perspective, I think uh, that it is a uh, accessibility is about uh, adapting the language that we use, the services that we provide, the technologies that we offer from our community pharmacies, and at the end, the, the professional care that, that we are providing to our patients. So that was all. Thank you very much uh, for listening. You have my email in, in there if you want to, to contact me, and I'll be delighted to, to answer any questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lala, for this excellent presentation. Um, again, that's a very important dimension of the design and, uh, and the architecture and, and the equipment and the conception of, of the space of a community pharmacy um, is clearly accessibility. Uh, and functionality, both for the patients and staff. So thank you very much. And I saw that one of the questions was asking whether these uh, guidelines from the Consejo are available in English as well. So maybe you can address that uh, in the Q&A box, because I'm sure that other people would be interested in accessing that. Thank you very much. Uh, if I can have the following slide, please. Thank you so much. To introduce our final speaker, uh, Dr. Aliki Pelletidi, uh, who is Academic Director for Education and Public Health Services Pharmacy Program Coordinator and Assistant professor, professor of Pharmacy Practice and Academic Director for Training and Service Provision uh, at the Department of Health Sciences at the University of Nicosia in Cyprus and also um, a Coordinator uh, of Professional Programs at the Federation of the Cooperative uh, Pharmacies of Greece. Um, and also the organization of FIP as well. Well, thank you very much, Aliki. And Aliki will be uh, presenting, we can have the following slide, I'm not sure if we still have a slide with the title of the presentation, but Aliki will be uh, presenting on a competition that was promoted by uh, the Federation of Cooperative Pharmacists of Greece uh, among architecture students. Uh, for the design of the 2020, 2030 uh, ideal community pharmacy. And her presentation will include the present, the AIDS short video, a brief video by the winners of that competition. So thank you so much for joining us today, uh, uh, Aliki. And um, Aliki has also delivered, uh, designed, delivered, and evaluated the first pharmacy health service conducted by Greek pharmacists, uh, which is already published. And she's also certified to conduct medication use reviews uh, by the University of Reading. And she also gained a certificate in obesity management at a postgraduate level from the same university. She's also a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy and CEDA. Uh, and she translated to Greek the pharmacy practice book edited by Jeffrey Harding and Kevin Taylor. She's also part of the editorial team of the journal in pharmaceutical policy and practice, as well as the pharmacy journal. Apologies for my poor Greek. Uh, and she's also an adjunct faculty at the Pharmacy School of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. So thank you very much, Aliki, for joining today's event. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for your invitation and the time that you are giving me to share our idea about pharmacy 2030. Just give me a second to share my presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my present. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, if you can yes. just put it on. Yes, that's okay. cool, but perfect. Because, uh, I'm, I'm... I'm reading the chat. Sorry. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I'm here today to to explain to you our philosophy and how we ended to conduct this competition in Greece. So first of all, in Greece there are eighty four point six pharmacies per one hundred thousand citizens, which means that we have a large proportion of pharmacies in Greece, and um, which means that. Uh, pharmacists are the main healthcare profession, the first point of call in Greece, mainly for the minor ailments and um, like conditions that 
the pharmacist can then refer to the doctor. In total, there are 10,500 pharmacies and through the cooperative pharmacies, we have 5,500 pharmacies, which means, which means half of them are within the uh, cooperative and the federation uh, of uh, pharmacies of Greece. S so Greek pharmacies are in a great position to help the individuals in any stage, at the prevention stage or at the disease management stage. So we had, we had a thought and we said, okay, the physiognomy of the Greek pharmacy, community pharmacy, but not only in Greece, but let's talk about Greece, is basically to promote the visitor as a client and is mainly product-centered rather than patient slash person-centered. So we thought that the Greek pharmacy promotes commercial character and this does not meet the FIP goals uh, th where they promote the person-centered approach. So uh, we said, okay, would like to improve uh, the Greek pharmacist role to become more clinical, to have a uh, more proactive role and be part of the primary health care. But the pharmacies as an architectural space is not ready to help the pharmacies to offer these further services. Apart from that, um, FIP goals states and that uh, like the main role of pharmacists will be the pharmacy services and all, all the other goals, the 21 goals that we maybe uh, all be aware by now. So we said, okay, the pharmacy space should be changed. We have a philosophy as part of the academic world in pharmacy, but also uh, as part of the Greek Federation, that we need to change this environment. For this reason, we, we basically um, designed the competition. The competition made between the University of Patras Architectural uh, uh, Department of Architecture, the Federation of the Cooperative Pharmacies of Greece, and the pharmacy program of the University of Nicosia. So first of all, before we go to the University of Patras Department of Architecture, we had a meeting with the Federation and we said, okay, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the skills to promote uh, the architectural space, to design the architectural space, to speak about um, the architectural space, but we have the knowledge, the passion, and the willing to change uh, how Greek pharmacists and in general community pharmacies uh, worldwide practice. Uh, I don't include countries that they already have a, a consultation room or specific services. I'm talking about countries that they now build the various services within uh, the community pharmacist. Apart from that, uh, as Gonzalo said, uh, we designed when I was in Kingston University, the first st uh, the first service, um, that was offered uh, through the Greek community pharmacies. This study was about the weight management service to minimize the risk of cardiovascular disease. And when I talked with uh, Greek pharmacies, because the study conducted in Greece, um, they were lacking of space and privacy when they conducted the service. So back in 2018, when the study conducted, we had this... Uh, idea and discussion uh, with pharmacists that we need to do something. So after the publication of the studies and when we the, uh, our ideas matured, uh, we had the conversation with the Federation and the president, Mr. Bill Lirakis, uh, to design and think how we can change uh, the architectural space in the community pharmacy to be ready uh, for 2030, because as you know, 2030 is the first milestone uh, for pharmacy. So by then, community pharmacies should offer various services, either essential, enhanced, or uh, um, advanced services. So what's the difference um, that we have compared to countries that they already have in consultation room? So we introduced two different spaces specifically for service provision. Uh, as you can see, 
the C space and the short care, I will explain to you, SC space. These are acronyms that I'm going to explain. So, okay, first of all, we will have the reception counter, which is the main area of the pharmacy, where, uh, as you can uh, imagine, we will offer services related to the distribution of medications, for example, dispensing um, over-the-counter medications or prescription medications, or we talk uh, with uh, our uh, visitors about their symptoms, minor ailments, and so on. And uh, the uh, visitors will have access during opening hours of the pharmacies. Whereas now the care room, which is the first innovation that we thought, is that we will have a small room, which is, if, if you can see the space, it's just uh, five meters square, uh, where the pharmacist will conduct services related to health promotion, disease prevention, disease management. So services that are related to health behaviors, such as smoking cessation, healthy eating, weight management, uh, alcohol brief intervention, uh, detection of vaccination needs, uh, screening in general. And uh, they, they need uh, more than uh, five to 10 minutes to complete. And this is important because the visitor access can be either during the opening hours or by appointment. So it's up to the pharmacist and uh, the visitor, the patient, when they will visit this uh, room. So this is the first room that we think it's, it's very, very important for the 2030 uh, pharmacy and pharmacist specifically new roles. Whereas the short time care room, uh, the, which is the second uh, proposed room. Again, it's a small uh, area, but here, apart from the health promotion, disease prevention and so on, uh, or uh, other services such as medicine reconciliation service, new medicine service, uh, we will have it when we will use it for less than five to 10 minutes for, like, let's say for injuries, uh, burns and um, conditions that can be treated quickly to the pharmacy. So why we divide it into different rooms? Because we thought that, let's say, the pharmacist may be in the care room with an appointment dealing with, the, let's say, the third appointment of the smoking cessation service. However, a patient or a visitor will come to the pharmacy uh, with an injury. So this, this needs space and privacy and to have all the equipment needed uh, to offer this service to the person. That's why we divided it into different uh, spaces called short care room and care room. And I think it's very important because we saw in Dr. Uh, Dital's presentation that even this consultation room is a packed room that basically is not actually used. They have the consultation room, but it's not um, basically ready to offer services rather than ticking boxes, because you are may aware that the UK some services are stopped uh, through the community pharmacies because it was ended as the tick box service. So basically, we are here to to present you this idea that can be replicated in other countries as well that they don't have specific requirements and the legislation does not enforce pharmacies to have a consultation room. Um, for the short care room, um, the visitor can access it through uh, opening hours. There is no need for an appointment. Apart from this room, of course, the pharmacy should have an office. Uh, where um, there, there will be like the scientific and research work or the pharmacy should carry out administrative and clinical tasks. And of course, I'm not going to go deeply in the architectural requirements because I'm here uh, as my role as a pharmacist and academic, not uh, as an architecture. Uh, but when the competition was on, there were specific requirements that the students should follow to design the specific rooms. So the visitors will not have access to this uh, space, but it's important um, that 
the scientific library, library of the pharmacy uh, can be um, in a place that there is a possibility a patient or a visitor can um, uh, take a book uh, to have a look or the pharmacist can show uh, to the to the patient an image or something that they would like to discuss. So it's important to, to have access from different spaces of the pharmacy. So we have the laboratory, uh, the lab, where there we will have the preparation area for galenic medications. So these are the drugs prepared in the pharmacy laboratory, laboratories within the community pharmacy. Again, we have uh, special requirements that the students should uh, have uh, uh, follow uh, to complete it. And of course, we need uh, um, some requirements through the Greek uh, legislation about the laboratory. Of course, we need the stockroom um, and the stockroom should um, co contain a refrigerator, um, freezer, storage, cupboards, and so on, benches, tables for receiving, opening, checking the, the medications and the products. And of course, should uh, have uh, access, uh, direct on connectivity uh, to, the, to the main area, because as you can imagine, we need to move uh, the products and the medications to the main area. So we have also uh, the auxiliary rooms. So we need, break areas, we need to conduct staff meetings. Um, as you know, in most countries, uh, we have overnight shifts. In Greece, we have overnight shifts. So this means that the pharmacy should have an area to rest. And also we have um, a storage area and a space, of course, for uh, lavatory. Um, and of course, the visitor access is only to the uh, lavatory during the opening hours. And then we have the free area, as uh, you can see, I will show you again uh, the, main, um, the main space area. Maybe you want to take a picture of uh, our proposed uh, community pharmacy. And of course, we need the free area to have free movements. Um, we'll have the visiting a visitor waiting area because when we have an appointment, we may be late, so the person should wait. Um, and also we need space for the parapharmaceutical products such as uh, products, dermatological pro products or baby care products and, and so on. But the main point of this, um, of this pharmacy is that 90% of the pharmacy is ready to provide various services. And the 10% of the pharmacy is based uh, about sales uh, uh, of products. So we are trying to transform the product tender pharmacy to a person center uh, pharmacy. So uh, we had two main criteria um, for the winner. The main, the, the major uh, criteria uh, criterion uh, was to follow the philosophy of the 2030 pharmacy uh, and the FIP goals. And as you will see, um, follow up to the video, you will see that the winners followed the 21 um, FIP goals, which was our aim, main aim. And also to have a common architectural identity, to, to have um, all like the requirements that um, the legislation set to open a pharmacy. Uh, so the competition jury consisted of architectures. Um, most of them uh, were uh, professors, assistant and associate professors at the University of Patras, University of Ioannina. And also we were two pharmacists, one academic, myself, and one community pharmacist who is practicing in Greece. And he's also the president of the Federation of Cooperative Pharmacies of Greece. So based on the criteria that I told you, so basically to follow both uh, the FIP goals and the goals that we set uh, with the uh, uh, Greek Federation and the pharmacy program at the University of Nicosia, but also to follow um, the architectural like regulations uh, about uh, community uh, pharmacies.
So now I will move to the last section of my presentation, uh, which is basically the video from the winner. So after two extensive meetings, face-to-face uh, -face meetings, um, we decided that this idea is the best idea uh, to represent the pharmacy of 2020. We had uh, 34 um, candidates and we chose uh, this one. So I'm gonna stop here and let's listen uh, together uh, their video. It's just uh, you there. It is an honor for- Sorry? Uh, sorry to interrupt you there. Um, we are now on the hour that our webinar uh, was scheduled to finish. So uh, I understand that some people may need to leave uh, due to other commitments. Uh, we will continue and you are welcome to show your slides and anyone who can stay longer uh, is welcome to stay, of course, to watch the presentation. We will unfortunately not have the time for the discussion and the Q&A afterwards. Uh, so uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank also our speakers and panelists today and apologize that we did not have time to address uh, further questions. So uh, thank you all. And please, Vicky, uh, please continue with the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. For us to participate in this conference as young candidates, presenting our concept to a worldwide audience. This is the winning concept for the student architecture competition organized by the Department of Architecture of the University of Patra, the Federation of Pharmacists Cooperatives of Greece, and the pharmacy program of University of Nicosia to design the pharmacy of 2030. To join our team, I am Christos Bacnis. I am Dim Dragada. My name is Mina Sabani. We are students with distinction from the School of Architecture in the Technical University of Crete in Greece. And we are truly grateful to the organizers for this opportunity, and especially to Mrs. Aleki Pelletiti. Let us present our project. According to the FIP research, retain a minor fraction of the services that the 2030 pharmacy is intended to deliver, with a major focus being on a person-centered approach to the requirements of the visitor and the provision of primary health care. The main concept aims to redefine the idea of the pharmacy as the responsibilities of the pharmacist are changing. The pharmacist is both a therapist and a health advisor. This translates into a modifying space of the pharmacy by creating places for purposes linked to the therapy and research while maintaining the retail character of the pharmacy. As a result, the idea of a human-centered approach comes to the forefront. Users such as care and laboratory are integrated into the pharmacy. The design of the proposal for the new 2030 pharmacy can be adapted to various spaces. This proposal applies the same design philosophy to two completely different in safe existing retail spaces, space A and space B, to understand the key parts of the concept and its adaptability. And here are the plans for the final design of the two different spaces. As the FFIP goes, providing organization, profession, and the end user with a tangible, achievable, and purposeful scope of work set against clear priorities. We try to achieve that in the framework of the Pharmacy 2030 competition as well, with the idea of creating an open platform for discussion with achievable sets of spatial priorities. Entering the scale, the space, and uh, the the first thing that the visitor meets in the, is the welcome counter where they can have a, a first contact with the pharmacist. Following the counter is the expertise of them, a wooden piece of furniture on which pharmacists can display the products on their expertise. This item can be placed in a prominent position and can strengthen and differentiate the, the pharmacy in the community. Thanks, uh, Asimina, for that. I will continue. After, a resting area has been created where the visitor can relax, get informed about the displayed products and the right way of recycling use or expired medicines, limiting negative consequences for the environment, promoting awareness to the local community. Opposite to that, we have the short care booth. In our proposal, the main concept of a human-centered approach comes to the forefront. 
This room can get isolated acoustically and optically by the use of a white curtain and a circular acoustic baffle. The visitor receives checkups and health advice in a short period in an environment where the wood dominates as material offering the feeling of calmness and warmth. Another element worth mentioning is the tablet and beauty bar. In this area, the visitor can be informed about the products and treatments suitable for each case. They can try products or search for them on the provided tablets. In this way, the visitor can easily explore the e-shop with the pharmacist assistance and receive personalized advice. Lastly, we have the end of the counter and the personalized services at the end of, the, of completing this spatial loop inside the, the pharmacy. We have the custom green shelving system. It is one of the main elements of our proposal. It's made of different parts for the shelving system. Those parts can be transformed and adapted to the needs of the pharmacy. This idea came uh, for us from in situ visits on pharmacies in Greece, but also in Europe. Uh, we noticed that in many pharmacies, uh, they had advertising materials which were placed frequently, causing a large environmental footprint as they ended up as waste. Here is the kit of parts, including, but it's not limited to a touch screen, which is very important for communicable diseases uh, or ads in general, a green wall panel, shelves, and smart signage. Closing, this is a summary of our design proposal and with uh, uh, five elements. Uh, Thank you for your attention. As the FIP goals try to retain a tangible result, we also hope that this uh, proposal, we can create some sort of dialogue about a new human-centered pharmacy and work as a platform for future discussions. Thanks again, and let's keep in touch. Hello to everyone. So um, these uh, were the these were the the winners. Uh, I hope that this uh, presentation helped you uh, to basically start a new conversation about uh, the architectural space of community pharmacies, and not only in Greece but in other countries. Because our scope now is to. Uh, replicate this competition uh, in uh, other countries such as Cyprus, uh, but also um, a comment that I would like to do is to make sure that pharmacy program is aware in all like universities about is aware about are aware sorry about uh, the new roles of pharmacies. So to teach the new roles of pharmacies together with the architectural needs. So I cannot teach a pharmacist, a future pharmacist, without mentioning that the current pharmacy structure will not help you to offer these services. So it's a responsibility for me as an academic to make them sure that they know what they need, not only in terms of uh, knowledge and skills, clinical skills, but also what to expect when they will go and open their own pharmacy or when they will renovate uh, the, the, far, the current uh, pharmacies that they may have or their parents uh, have. And on the other hand, the architectural uh, like departments to teach the architectures uh, how to design uh, not only community pharmacies, but in general, how to design uh, uh, healthcare spaces because it's very important and in all healthcare like environments we need uh, a person-centered approach not only in the community but also in hospital and other sectors thank you very much thank you so much Aliki and many congratulations to these young architects who have won the competition with this grant proposal uh, not only from our uh, uh, a design point of view and aesthetic, but, but mainly about incorporating the development goals and the principles of innovation in pharmacy practice and patient-centered approaches uh, into their project. So uh, as I mentioned, we do not have time, unfortunately, for a, a, a q and a. We have asked our speakers to address most of the questions uh, that were sent by the Q&A box. And basically, I would just like to thank all our speakers today 
uh, for the wonderful presentations. We've had a really high number of participants. Uh, I, think, I believe we had about um, 500 people that attended in total. Uh, at this moment, even though we are over time, we still have nearly 400 people attending. So thank you all very, very much for your interest uh, and for the excellent presentations that we've given. We hope that uh, the principles of uh, these presentations of functionality, innovation, patient-centered needs and accessibility uh, can be incorporated into design of your pharmacies. And as Laura mentioned in her presentation, it's really not about having a very flashy or a very expensive renovation of your pharmacies, but really applying the principles of a patient-centered approach that is suitable with the services we want to provide as part of pharmacy practice. Thank you again, and have a rest of a good day or evening, depending where you are. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.